Welcome to the D-Spot Podcast. Dr. Dana McNeil is a licensed marriage and family therapist who specializes in working with couples using the Gottman Method. Her evidence-based practice provides support for the wide range of relationship issues that modern couples face. By using her open, affirming, and outside-of-the-box thinking, Dr. Dana is able to approach her work with couples by bringing both insights and tools that reflect the realities of today's complicated relationships. Dr. Dana features guests on her podcast that include a unique array of celebrities, CEOs, influencers, and everyday folks who are all working on navigating new conversations about how society views what goes into a successful relationship. And now, here's your host, Dr. Dana McNeil. Hello, and welcome to the D-Spot Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Dana McNeil. This is the podcast for everything about relationships and people in them. Today, I am excited to introduce you to Dr. Tammy Nelson. She's a board-certified sexologist, licensed relationship therapist, and a TEDx speaker. She's also the author of a book that I think is amazing that I want to make sure that we talk about today called Open Monogamy, A Guide to Co-Creating Your Ideal Relationship Agreement, Integrative Sex and Couples Therapy When You're the One Who Cheats. I mean, she's written so many books. She's also written The New Monogamy. She's written Getting the Sex You Want and What's Eating You. She is an amazing author and very approachable. And that's something that I like the most about her work. Um, She's been quoted as an expert, which she should be, in the New York Times, um, New York Times Magazine, the Wall Street Journal, Rolling Stone Magazine, Washington Post, CNN, The Sun, Time Magazine, it just goes on and on. She (laughs) is also, as if she's not busy enough, the director of the Integrative Sex Therapy Institute and host of the podcast, The Trouble with Sex. Welcome, Dr. Tammy. It's very nice to meet you. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Of course. So tell us a little bit about your newest book, The Open Monogamy. What inspired the book for you? Well, open monogamy means having a primary partnership with a flexible or fluid monogamy agreement. So, so many people that I see today in my private practice, and I've been seeing couples for over 30 years, really are looking for ways to create a monogamy that works for them. They want to be committed, right? But they also want to have a passionate, sexy uh, relationship for the rest of their lives. They don't want to get divorced. They don't want to cheat. They don't want to lie. But they want to do stuff together or separately, but be honest about it. And Mm. so what I see as monogamy today is that it's not necessarily defined by morality or you know, this is not your grandmother's monogamy, right? Right. (laughs) This is like a new kind of monogamy where it's really defined by integrity and honesty and transparency. And I think every couple is doing it differently. So it's really defined by openness and it can be anything along a big continuum of however they want to define that. And I, you do talk in your book about the continuum. Tell us a little bit about what would be on the continuum. What would be like one end of the spectrum and the other end of the spectrum from your work that you've done? Yeah, so um, the monogamy continuum means that um, couples define what it means to be monogamous differently today because there's so much on the internet that you can do. Like when we get married or com- have a committed partnership, we don't say I promise to love, honor you and and tell you every time I have like an Instagram friend, right? Like <laughs> we have a whole new need for definition today, I think about what it means to be monogamous. It, that was not like that even 20 years ago, it was right. totally different. And we didn't have to have discussions around you know, do you send pictures of yourself on TikTok? And do you, you know, have friends on? I just talked to someone who was, you know, connecting with an ex in Clubhouse. Like some people have these new social media um, uh, challenges that create these monogamy dilemmas. So the, the monogamy continuum is, you know, all the way on the left side, on the more traditional conservative side, do we even talk about things like fantasies like what if I um go to the grocery store and I see someone who's really hot and 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 I'm like oh my god they are so good looking do I tell my partner or what if we see someone on tv do I go like oh my god that guy's incredibly hot or that woman is beautiful 
are we telling each other that or is that like a betrayal does that feel like we've sinned in our hearts or do we tell each other every time we get a picture of an ex on on Facebook or do we you know flirt with other people on Twitter or is that something we share or you know is it private is it part of our own world and then as we move up the continuum what is flirting what is an emotional affair do you have lunch with your ex do you have you know dinner with your best friend and tell them all about your sex life like what is it what is privacy and what is secrecy and then we have you know do you have sexual experiences with with your partner but only with your partner so maybe you go to a sex party or a sex club and you walk around and you check it out, but you only do those things when you're together or maybe even have a threesome, but those are shared experiences in the same room. You might define yourself as like swingers or being in an open relationship, right. but only shared experiences. And then all the way to the right side of the continuum, the more open polyamorous side where you might have romantic or emotional relationships with other people separately or shared, but you define what that means to your, to your monogamy. So there's a really wide range of potential there. So when your partner says, I'd like to be in an open relationship, well, first of all, let's talk about what do you even mean? Because what you mean and what I mean could be two totally different things. Right. Open for one, what you're saying is open for one might be, I get to look at your texts. And the other one is like, no, no, no. I'm like having sex with someone else. And so is this a, this sounds like it's a value system conversation. Well, I think that's part of it for sure. I think you should have a conversation about what are our most important values? Like what are we going to come back to over and over that bring us together as a couple? So I call that like, what's your North star? Like, Mm -hmm. what is your do North? Like we always come back to the idea that our relationship is number one or, and so anything that threatens that we got to like chill out on, or maybe it's honesty is number one. And no matter what, we're going to be honest with each other, but we have to define what that means. Like, is it honest about what we're thinking or feeling or honest about what we're doing? Or maybe you know, our values are um, that what we do is important to us, but nobody else needs to know. It's personal to us. We don't tell our family or or our friends at work or our kids don't have to know, our parents don't have to know. You know, what we do is important to us and it's private. So that's a really important thing, what you're asking. Like, what are our values and how do we have those conversations? Are there questions that you find are helpful to help couples get clear on where to start these conversations because I imagine there could be a lot of defensiveness um yeah I think that's a really important conversation to have and I, and people ask me all the time like how do you start that like right you know what do you do so I think um a good place to start might be to say you know I heard on Dr. Dana's podcast that she was interviewing someone about opening your relationship and what do you think of that you know, I call it the what if conversation. Like, ah, what okay. If, like what I'm tossing out a hypothetical. I'm not invested in the outcome. It's just cash. Just cash. <laughs> you know, just, it's a what if fantasy. What if uh-huh. we, what would be the problems and what would be the potential benefit to us? But, you know, keep it at a fantasy. I always say, keep it at that what if fantasy Mm. a lot longer than you think way before you take anything into action. Mm. I'm imagining that you have clients that come to see you that didn't keep it in the fantasy and tried things and were a little bit messy by the time they got to you. How do you help them get back on course? Well, I think sometimes people uh, try to open their relationship as a way to heal from an affair or yeah. You know, some kind of breach or betrayal to their monogamy. And to even I, things up in some way, some cosmic balance. Sometimes, sometimes it's like a, um, it's like trying to make a non-consensual non-monogamy more consensual. Like give me permission. Mm-hmm. I've already done it, but now I just want you to sign off on it yeah. so I can continue. And I don't think that really works. I think, no. I think it's more important that if you're interested in it, that you know, you start off honest and try to talk about it first. However, that doesn't mean it can't work if you've already, 
you know, messed up the monogamy. <laughs> you know, we all we all try to do the best we can, but none of us are perfect. And that doesn't mean that we don't care or love about our partner. So, yeah. you know, the new monogamy was redefining your relationship after infidelity. And how do you open up a conversation about how to sort of reboot your relationship? And so it's not that it can't be done. It absolutely can be done, um, but it helps to go to therapy. And what kind of questions or topics do you bring up as a therapist to try to help them open up the conversation about what do we want this to look like moving forward? Because I'm imagining you're asking them to set up some agreements, right? So are you checking in with them about, yes, their values, but are are there boundaries coming up? Like, how do you give them each a safe space if they don't agree on how much they want to open it up? Well, I think one of the most important conversations is what are our red lines? Mm. So where are the places that, look, this is just not going to fly for me. So an example might be um, if we are going to have sex with other people, it can't be somebody from work or it can't be someone that you've already had an affair with, or it can't be without protection or we have to do it together or it can't be um it can only be when you're on vacation or i'd rather shut this whole thing down than do it with this person that you keep talking about you know like you know well, sometimes people have really hard lines where they just can't cross and those are important to start with i think and so I imagine that sometimes partners make agreements and then one gets excited about the new relationship energy or things go a little bit different than they expected. And then they have to come back and like deal with the consequences. What would consequences be for couples who broke an agreement? Well, first of all, I think that it's important to start with this idea about the the difference between boundaries and rules. Mm -hmm. I don't think rules really work in this case because rules imply that somebody has to keep the other person in line and they're going to have to follow up to see, you know, did you follow the rules? And then if you break the rules, who's Mm going to punish the other person? And what are the, what are the, you know, the punishments going to be? I mean, that becomes sort of parental, right? So if I say, well, the rules are you have to come home at midnight if you go out with someone. Well, what if you come on at one? I got to wait up for you to make sure you're home. And then if you come home at one, we got to reevaluate the whole talk. And now I'm sort of your mother. And that's not hot at all. And right. I don't have time for that. So I don't think we can start off with a conversation about rules. However, we can have a conversation about each of our our own personal boundaries. Like you can't put boundaries on someone else. Boundaries are personal to us. And our boundaries can be quite flexible. Like maybe I would, you know, my boundaries are like, I don't want to wait up for another person to come home or I don't ever want you to be out with someone else so that I have to sit up. Like that's a weird boundary for me. Like I don't want that. Mm-hmm. But maybe, maybe I could be flexible with that. Maybe I meet someone where I'm like, I kind of want to go on a date with this person. And so maybe we should shift those boundaries a little bit, or maybe I don't mind having you out, you know, once a week. So I can have a night to myself and I'm surprisingly not bothered by that. Mm. I hear all those stories all the time about people who start off with a lot of rigid boundaries around what they think they can handle. And then after a while, they're like, oh, this is just making us feel closer. Like this is not threatening our relationship at all. And I have no problem with this happening because I know you're not going to leave me. And I know that this is not going to take away from our relationship. It's actually going to add to our relationship. So what I'm hearing you say is that we might be more rigid at the beginning because it's new, it's frightening. And then as we kind of go along, this should be an evergreen conversation that we're constantly like coming back to. And does what we decided three weeks ago still need to apply? And can we find some flexibility in it? Or how are we each feeling about what we're asking of each other? Yeah, absolutely. I think it should be a a conversation that you revisit quite often. And it could go the other way too. I mean, you could have a um, an agreement that you each have 
that you each have the ability to like shut it down if it goes bad, if you feel uncomfortable, if you're saying, you know what, this really isn't working for me. I really don't like doing this. I don't like the way we're doing it. I think we need to take a break. I think we need to to stop it for now. Or I think at this time in our life, it's not working. If you have an agreement beforehand that that you each have that power to like pull the plug and you respect that in each other, I think that's important too. Now, whether or that, not that's going to work, like sometimes people right. get in there and they're like, I'm not stopping. This is great. Yeah, I was... Uh... I had a chat with Martha Cowpey and she was saying, yeah, what about this third person that's now or fourth person that's in this relationship with you because you've decided that you didn't know what to expect or you get cold feet and you back out. There's this whole other relationship that you're asking to disrupt. I think that's a really good point. And I think as therapists in particular, a lot of times uh, they can be, you know, with all due respect to all therapists, because it's a pretty new field. I think yeah. therapists can kind of be dismissive to those other partners mm-hmm. and not take into account the fallout of creating these outside relationships and that there are feelings that get, can get. Absolutely. Because these rules that you were referencing earlier, which I agree, we're not supposed to, you know, it, it's not the spirit of what we're going after to close things down, right? And create rules because the other person, this third or fourth person did not get to participate in the rulemaking. They're just subject to the consequences of it, right? That they get, don't get to have any say or any space in the room and their, their real emotions there. If they don't get to have a veto power or even to say, okay, I'm willing to go along with this for a year, but then can we change the rules, right? Can I be a participant in it? Well, I mean, sometimes, you know, they can be involved. It depends on what kind of relationship you want, you know, like, do you want to have a relationship as a couple, like with another couple? Do you want a third party in your relationship, like being a thrumple? Mm -hmm. Do you want to just have casual sex with people, you know, at parties? You know, how deep do you want to get into another relationship with someone? Maybe it's just clearly a sexual thing. And those are your boundaries. And it's not about negotiating people's emotional connection to you. It's really about keeping really clear boundaries around your involvement with other people. Maybe you're just watching porn together. You know, like maybe it's really truly staying in that fantasy realm where you're never touching other people, but you have welcomed in this fantasy to your relationship. You could go on that for the rest of your lives. That could be really hot for your relationship and new energy that, you know, perhaps can keep your relationship really passionate and alive. What would a couple who is just starting to venture into this contemplation expect to receive from a therapist like yourself? What kind of guidance would you give them? What would a session look like? Well, I'm very clear about not wanting to uh, create the agreement for the couple. It's not really my job to decide for you what you want your monogamy to look like. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm here to help you learn how to talk about it Mm -hmm. and to help you as a couple uh, close what I call the monogamy gap, because usually people have a big gap in what they're really looking for or desiring. And there's an implicit assumption that we're going to want the same thing, but explicitly, once we start to talk about it, and make everything explicit, we usually have much different ideas about what these terms even mean. Mm. You know, when we say let's open our relationship mm. or let's be polyamorous or let's do something like swinging, like mm. most people have totally different ideas of what that's gonna look like. And so it's really about, let's make all these conversations explicit and learn how to talk about mm. our desires and our fantasies and even our, um, conflictual moments, like let's really learn how to communicate. I mean, it's really true that couples who know how to communicate do much, much better, but we don't really know how to communicate. We think, you know, I'll just wait till you stop talking and then it's my turn. And I already know what you're going to say. And I can finish your sentence and, you know, I know where you're going with this. So let me just jump in and tell you what, what I think you're thinking. You know, that's not communication. Mm-hmm. There isn't anything new here, right? It's not new territory. I like what you're saying, though, because very much when I hear couples say these big, broad umbrella terms, like let's open up the relationship and there's this 
impression for the other partner that if I don't say yes, then that means I'm not hip, I'm not cool, I'm trying to keep you from doing something. And then I sort of just say yes to go along because I don't know what the next steps are. And then when we find ourselves in a behavior that I don't like, then all of a sudden I'm objecting because I didn't really check in with you about what does that look like, right? What you're saying is if we're going to use a big broad term, like let's open up for a relationship, what behaviors would you expect to be happening on your end in an opening of a relationship so that I get some real clear expectations from you about what I'm agreeing to or what I'm considering? Yeah. And, and you bring up a good point about, you know, it never works if people feel coerced into it. Yeah. No, yeah. if you're going to feel manipulated or just doing it because you think your partner wants it, um, it's not going to work. And your partner needs to talk about what they imagine could go wrong and the risks to the relationship, just like the one who may not be as enthusiastic might, you know, feel like the buzz killer in the relationship. But the one who, you know, tends to be more enthusiastic and wants to open it up is also statistically, at least in, in my anecdotal experience, the one who also wants to shut it down quicker. Huh. What do you attribute that to? Well, I think the person who's more enthusiastic has a fantasy about what it's going to be like. Mm -hmm. And so they're more quick to try to dive into it without exploring some of the risks that might be inherent in it. And the person that's naturally more reticent has thought more about the risks. So once they're ready to do it, um, and frankly, it, it tends to be more females who are more reticent, heterosexual females, they think about it more, but once they're ready to do it and they are like the gatekeepers, I'm like, okay, I'm ready to do it. Once they're in, they're like, okay, I'm not stopping. <laughs> and they're like, I've thought about it. I'm, I worked all, I worked through all my stuff and now I'm having a good time. And like, you want to stop? I don't think so. I'm, I'm good. So if it's more of like just something on the spur of the moment that you're like, hey, let's spice it up versus let me be contemplative about it, view the pros and cons, get some therapy about it. It's less likely to possibly have a good outcome. It's more likely to have a good outcome the more you process it before you do it, mm -hmm. the more you talk about the potential problems and the potential positives. Mm -hmm. And um the more you're talking about it while it's happening. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, sometimes you can have what I call communication fatigue. Like you can just talk it to death. And, you know, sometimes couples are like, oh my God, we talk every <laughs> o'clock in the morning. And like, we just have to do it. Like, let's just do it. I'm just tired of talking about it. And then sometimes they start to do it and then they talk about it all the time because it brings in this new energy and they're really excited about it. But then that becomes almost a crutch for their relationship. Ah, okay. Because we're not doing we're not doing other things to help push kick the can down the road. We're relying on this to be something that's carrying us. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Great. These are great tips. Do you have any other tips for couples that are like either on the brink of deciding to do this or in the messed up phase on the continuum, what do you have to say to, to couples that are hearing this? Well, I'd be really careful about how you bring up some of your fantasies so that you're not saying, you know, let's say you have a fantasy of having a threesome, bringing someone else into the relationship. I would talk to your partner about, uh, you know, I have this sort of fantasy about adding someone in to our relationship, instead of saying, I want to bring over our neighbor, Susie. <laughs> so, like, talk about it in the abstract first before you right. talk about it specifically. And, you know, if your partner says, yeah, that sounds really hot, like, to begin the conversation, like, who would we really want to do this with? Would it be someone we know? Would it be a friend? Would it be a, mm -hmm. a stranger? Would it be someone we met online? What would be the safest person? Like, what would be the repercussions of that? Because if you start saying, oh, yeah, I've been thinking about Susie for a long time. <laughs> it doesn't feel like I'm co-creating it with you. It's like I have to decide whether or not I think Susie and Joe are hot. Yeah. And then it brings up a lot of stress at the neighborhood barbecue where <laughs> Susie and Joe are there and you're like, my husband's really hot for you. And oh, great. Like, now I have to decide if I want to be hot for you. Okay. I totally get it. Totally get it. Tell us about some of your other books. You've written so many. How do you have time to write all of these books? I'm astonished. 
I don't sleep ever. <laughs> <laughs> you don't look like you don't sleep. You look fantastic. Oh, uh, so no. is there a favorite of the books that you've written? Um, and I do actually sleep. I'm not, <laughs> I'm just joking around about that. I'm really loving this book. I mean, this book is bringing up so many interesting conversations with people from all walks of life. You know, I love talking to the, <laughs> to the press about it. Sometimes I get these like TV interviews where one of the like TV hosts will say, oh my God, I left this book on my bedside table for my, <laughs> my partner. And like people in the newsroom will be like, <laughs> will be like, you know, the cameraman will be, be right before the set goes on. They'll be like, I just bought this book. And, <laughs> and then you'll get people in, on the radio. Sometimes they'll interview me and they'll be so open to the book. And then I'll get on the radio and they'll be like, do you know, this is against God's will. Oh no. <laughs> I'll be like, whoa, okay. Well, that's a bait and switch. That doesn't feel good. But it's okay. You know, it's much different than it was 10 years ago when the new monogamy came out and people said that I was even therapists, I was getting like hate mail from people who said I was creating infidelity. And so I, I love like, that you're starting a conversation. It, we don't have a right to talk about what's happening in somebody's bedroom. It's not my bedroom. And the fact that we're actually having a conversation, so it doesn't have to be closeted. It doesn't have to be hidden. It doesn't have to be shameful. It's like own yourself. We don't have to be these uptight therapists that think we should control what's happening in someone else's life even if you don't think it works that's your personal prerogative right you don't get to have a say other than like here's some things to think about can you minimally just like do that versus like tell somebody they're going to be a failure I get it I I love that you're doing this and it's an important conversation well even the book that I wrote getting the sex you want or when you're the one who cheats I think you know, they all have their challenges for the field of psychotherapy because, you know, like you said, we're talking about things that are actually happening in people's lives, but are yeah. difficult for therapists uh, to talk about because there's so much bias and stress to talk about sex or to talk about cheating or to talk about things that are not um, from the, you know, the victim side or the, um, the protected side. Like we actually have to talk about things that might make us uncomfortable. But, you know, part of the reason I'm doing this podcast is I want couples therapy to be more approachable. And if we're not creating a safe space for every form of couple, not just the popular ones or the ones that we feel comfortable with, and we're not, we're not really doing our job. So, I mean, you're definitely on the forefront of creating normalcy about every kind of couple that wants to seek support and making it so approachable. So I really appreciate the work that you're doing. It's meaningful. Thanks, Dana. I appreciate that. You're welcome. So talk about your podcast. Who, what should we, what should we expect to hear if we tune into your podcast? It's called Getting, it's I wrote the it down, trouble, the trouble, trouble with Sex. sex. So, and, yeah. And so I interview researchers and authors and uh, scientists and people that are in the field of sexuality where there's, um, you know, troublesome behavior that society is judgmental about. So a lot of the things that you're talking about, you know, things that are difficult for people in their personal lives that they're having trouble with, and also things that are troublesome in society. So, um, you know, the hot topics that are in culture or that are, you know, hidden in our bedrooms are usually yeah. the things that are on the podcast. And it's just great to talk to people, you know, things about like sex work or BDSM and kink or um, anal sex, you know, things that are just fun. Yeah. No, I've listened to it. It's very approachable. I, I, again, I love that you're not the nerdy science therapist that we visualize with our horn rim glasses and our clipboard who doesn't have any connection or is not somebody that you can like relate to. So yeah, check out your podcast, check out all your books. How do people find you if they want to connect with you? Well, thank you. I, you can go to my website, drtammynelson.com and you can find my books on Amazon anywhere they're sold. Um, if you want to find out more about open monogamy, it's at openmonogamy.com or open monogamy, a guide to co-creating your ideal relationship agreement. Thank you so much, Tammy. I appreciate all of your time and keep doing you because it's amazing. And thank you for, for hanging out with us for a bit. Thank you. And thanks for your great work in the world. Aww, thank you. Take good care. You too. 
This has been the D-Spot Podcast with Dr. Dana McNeil. To learn more about Dr. Dana's practice, simply visit us at www.danamcneil.com.